So, what do you think, Takumi? Was having this thing outfitted with the turbo worth all the trouble? I don't know. It felt a little weird to me. I mean, the car definitely has more power now, that's for sure. But all in all, its strengths are just different than my own ride, so it'd take some getting used to. Ever wondered what the turbo actually does for the car? Or what it means to supercharge a car instead of turbocharge? And how they make those loud whistling sounds? They're both used for boosting engine power by means of forcing more air into the engine. This allows the engine to burn fuel more effectively. But the methods, benefits, and even the sounds from the engine and exhaust are different. In this video, we're covering the differences of turbocharged and supercharged engines, pros and cons of each, common setups, and answering the age-old question, which is better? Let's start with the supercharger. The supercharger is mechanically driven. That means it has a direct response through your revs and is controlled by how much you press on the gas pedal or throttle. Superchargers are operated by the serpentine belt which transfers power from the engine's crankshaft in a pulley system. The pulley? <laughs> the pulley diameter and construction allow for simpler tuning or adjusting the supercharger's performance characteristics. Inside the supercharger is a gear drive that turns the rotors, and as outside air enters through the air filter and intake pipe, these interlocking rotors force air through the supercharger housing. The long fins or ridges on these rotors are called lobes, they span the length of the rotor in either straight or twisted patterns. These interlocking rotors are what compresses the air through the supercharger, pushing it out a discharge port at the base of the housing and into the engine. Superchargers have a distinct, powerful roar of sorts. This is due to a combination of factors, be it the high rotation of the gears inside the supercharger or the sudden intake of air around the impellers. And the gear drive can be similar to the gearbox of circuit cars, which is why they can sound similar. Superchargers generally come in three basic setups. First, we'll cover the root system. The supercharger came before the turbo, being designed in as early as 1860 with its first automotive applications in 1923, having the same marketing as Mortal Kombat. Put a K in front of everything to make it sound cooler. This system uses identical symmetrical rotors. Think of the supercharger as the most commonly used in media and films as the sort to bring in that loud engine roaring. This is in large part due to how it functions. The other superchargers we'll cover are designed to compress air, but this one doesn't, making this setup referred to as the blower engine, like a leaf blower strapped to your car. Next is the twin screw or Lysholm system. As the name implies, it features complex rotors with screw-shaped lobes to compress air as it passes through. The male and female set of screws compresses this air to create a greater boost in power. It's one of the better superchargers in terms of performance, but due to its complexity is much more costly. The last supercharger setup we'll cover is a special one. The previous two are positive displacements, meaning they move the same amount of air for each engine revolution regardless of RPM. This also means they can make boost immediate even at low RPMs providing a linear power curve. A compressor, huh? You've switched over to a supercharger? Yeah, that's right. The kind of immediate response you get from a supercharger isn't all that different from an NA. But you don't get all the nitpicky BS with this puppy like you do with the turbo, so it's a lot like switching over to a large displacement engine. The centrifugal system is essentially a turbocharger that is mechanically driven. Like the turbo, this system provides an exponential power curve and makes full boost at the engine's redline. This supercharger is an ideal for low RPMs taking time to spool up. Superchargers are normally attached to top the engine with a liquid or air to water inner cooler. This is because warm air is dispersed or spaced out while cool air is dense. And again, the engine needs the cold, dense air to help provide that boost in engine performance. Now for the turbochargers. We've already covered the turbo and its history. To briefly go over what a turbo does, it reuses the waste exhaust from an engine to draw in and compress air to create a power boost and are directly tied into the exhaust system. In turbo setups, the exhaust manifolds may be specially designed for turbo placement and to handle increased heat and pressure. The turbo uses two separate compartments. These are called the turbine section and compressor section. Exhaust gas flows through the turbine section as exhaust heat and pressure drive the turbine or exhaust wheel. A sealed common shaft connects the exhaust turbine to the compressor wheel. The compressor wheel draws an outside air through a filter and intake pipeline. Next, it crams that air through a smaller chamber to build compression, leading towards the intercooler. Again, air through this process becomes heated and needs to be cooled. The reason a turbo makes that whistling or whining sound is because of the rapid movement of the air in the compressor blades. 
As the blade spins speeds during acceleration or spooling up, this change in air pressure and velocity is what creates the turbo whistle. Another turbo sound is the blow-off or wastegate noise. This happens when you let off the gas and excess pressure is vented from the intake. Now that you better understand how a turbo operates, here are the more common turbo setups. The single turbo airs out all exhaust through a single turbocharger. You're more likely to find this configuration stock when buying a new car such as on a Honda Civic. In a parallel setup, it splits the amount of exhaust pushed through the turbo. For instance, a twin turbo on a six-cylinder engine would have a turbo connected to each cylinder bank, allowing each turbo to operate with the three cylinders each. This greatly lowers the risk of back pressure buildup that could result from a single turbo. Sequential setups allow for one turbo at lower RPMs than the other, or both for higher speeds. This greatly reduces turbo lag, resulting in a more responsive and reliable engine boost. The third twin turbo setup is the series. As in the name, you have output from one turbo being compressed by the second turbo. This creates a sharp increase in pressure and boost. The last turbo setup we'll cover is the twin scroll turbo. It's a single turbo that almost functions like a twin. The exhaust flow travels in pulses of high and low pressure. The twin scroll separates the different pressures to maintain a continuous stream of maximum pressure into the turbine. The turbo and supercharger have their strengths and weaknesses, starting with the supercharger. Most supercharger setups deliver instant power the moment you press on the gas. They're driven by the crankshaft, so regardless of displacement, there isn't any lag. There is less heat buildup, so they don't need as much lubrication as turbos. The downside is that it creates a greater load on the engine because it's connected to the crankshaft. The car engine will need to be reformatted to handle the extra work, not to mention it takes up a lot more space than a turbo. Superchargers are generally 20 to 25% less fuel efficient than turbos. Oh, the old turbo's history. He said that puppy outfitted with a supercharger. He's got a supercharger? Turbochargers produce power by reusing exhaust gas. This helps with overall emissions. Plus, turbos allow for smaller engines to have the power of larger ones. Another major benefit is their fuel efficiency. However, the biggest drawback is the amount of time before the turbo kicks in. Because the turbo relies on kinetic energy from the exhaust, it needs to reach a certain level of pressure before it activates to function. This is called turbo lag, which is why most turbo engines don't perform well in low RPM ranges. A laggy turbo reminds me of the old days riding shotgun in my brother's lovin'. More oil lubrication is needed to keep the turbo going. And let's not forget the intricate installation involving the car's exhaust. Superchargers nowadays can add between 50 to 100 horsepower, while decent turbo setups can get 70 to 150. Both are able to increase engine power by 30 to 40 percent on average. They definitely help underpowered cars like the 8511. Additionally, it should be noted that you can combine the two. This process is called twin charging, providing significant power gains of forced induction. However, it's a complex process that only some of the most skilled mechanics can get working properly. Similar to the sequential twin turbo setup, the supercharger provides low RPM boost while the turbo adds additional boost in the high RPMs, something the Lancia, Nissan, and Volkswagen have started in the 80s, while Volvo still has such options available today. In the end, which one is the better choice? Superchargers are a less complex and cheaper way to increase engine performance, easier to maintain and tune, and be ideal in applications that require predictable boost at all RPMs. And it doesn't mean overall engine efficiency is sacrificed as some setups can increase fuel economy when not driven aggressively. But where's the fun in that? So this is what a supercharger feels like from the inside. Man, it's a completely different feel from my 8.6. I clocked in over 200 horsepower last time I put it on the chassis dynamo. They take power to make power, and an average setup can require 40 to 60 horsepower to function. Not exactly ideal for the downhill where it's more about balance rather than raw power. Not to mention aftermarket superchargers can even shorten the lifespan of your engine if the engine wasn't designed to handle the extra stress from the supercharger. Like for example, Fujiwara's 8.6 was refitted with a super high rev engine. Such engines that weren't designed with a supercharger add on a mine could end up exploding. And that's not a price you want to risk paying. I could save up for years, and I could never even dream of owning an engine like this. Hell, any street racer I know would sell their own mother in a heartbeat to have an engine like that in their ride, myself included. But when it comes down to it, the turbo is the better choice to go with. It helps your car, the environment, and your wallet with all that gas money you're saving. 
In some places, there are very strict gas emission standards that the turbo would help with. Plus, twin turbo and more electronic-based turbos are able to reduce engine lag at low RPMs as the technology advances. You'll find superchargers mainly used in the U.S. markets, but otherwise you'll find most cars switching to the turbo, and electric turbos are being considered a better option to help further reduce turbo lag. So why might some choose the supercharger? Or when should you use one? If you need to get high-speed boosts at lower RPMs or immediate power delivery for, let's say winding roads where getting higher revs would be a challenge or long straightaways. Not to mention they don't have the same drawbacks as the turbo in heavy rainy conditions. The supercharger is definitely a burner, as in it will burn through the life of your engine. While they are cheaper to install compared to the turbo, it won't do you good in the long run, especially for your wallet. But one very important thing to mention, regardless of whether or not you do add a turbo or supercharger, you can find the best on the market, but it won't function properly unless the electronics are updated to operate those components. Cars nowadays are much more technological, more of a mobile computer than cars before. You'll also need to think about the impact it will have on your car overall. Like how we discussed on comparing stock with modded, cars are fitted by the manufacturer for specific uses. That means these upgrades could add more wear and tear on the engine if it's not suited for such additions. With this, you should be able to reach a more informed decision on what to go with for your car. Keep in mind, not every car would have need for either application. It always comes down to what you use your car for and how efficient the engine runs now. Since you understand what a turbo and supercharger are, we can get to the fun stuff about the cars that utilize them. Let us know in the comments what setup you currently have if it's a turbo or supercharger, or if neither, then do you plan on getting one? If you enjoyed this video or learned something new, please leave a like, share, and subscribe to stay up to date on future content. Remember, keep those engines roaring.